First Samuel chapter one. Together tonight, we will study what it means to wait upon the Lord. And we'll be doing so through the lenses of Hannah, through the story of Hannah, looking at how God works through Hannah. And one of the things that I pray we'll come to see is that as you wait, faith acts. And this is a sermon title for tonight. As you wait, faith acts. It is a lengthy read, so we'll be unpacking these verses as we move along. But allow me to draw your attention to verse 19 and 20 for the time being. We read of the words. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Drema. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And the Lord called his name Samuel, for she said, I've asked for him from the Lord. Let's pray together. For indeed, we do thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for that promise, that wonderful truth, that strength rises as we wait upon you. That Father... As we wait, our faith is seen in action. As we wait, we do not take matters into our own hands, but we wait actively, knowing that in due time you will act. And so, Lord, we pray this evening that you would open up our ears that we may hear your word, open up our hearts that we may receive it and believe in it, so, Father, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight alone. Amen. This evening, as we look at what it means to wait upon the Lord, faith acts as we wait upon the Lord. We'll do so looking at three points in different verses. In verses 5 to 7, we'll, we'll look at as you wait, be patient and trust in the Lord. As you wait, be patient and trust in the Lord. And then in verses 9 to 11, as you wait, remember God is in control. God is in control. And thirdly, as you wait, God will act in verses 19 to 20. These are the truths that we believers need to hold on to as we wait upon the Lord. These are the virtues that must be present in our lives. These are the core beliefs that we must believe that God is in control. We are people that do not like to wait. We struggle with it. We try to avoid any place or any situation that will cause us to wait. Think about it for a moment. You dread the thought of going to home affairs early in the morning and lining up in that queue. And worst of it all, come 12 o'clock, they tell you system offline. <laughs> You've been there from the morning. What about on the road? When we're driving and a taxi driver cuts in front of you just to stop and drop off passengers. Dude, you could have waited. It's difficult. It's difficult to exercise patience. We can easily lose patience. We are prone to be impatient. We have become the instant generation. I want it and I want it now. How about this illustration? Two frogs fell into a tub of cream. One looked at the high side of the tub, which were too difficult to crawl, and he said, it is hopeless. So he resigned himself to death, relaxed and sunk to the bottom. The other one, determined to keep swimming as long as he could, something might happen, he said to himself. He kept kicking 
and kicking. And finally, he found himself on a solid platform of butter and jumped to safety. As believers, who God is our foundation, who God is our solid platform. He is the one to whom we run for safety. And in this narrative, we see how Naomi trusted in the Lord and how God was her strong foundation. And so let's look at the first verse, the first point. As we wait upon the Lord, we need to remember God is in control. Verses 5 to 7. Let's read those verses before us. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb, and her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. Well, let's put these verses into context. What we have here is a young woman named Hannah who was married to a man named Alkanah. We see that in verse 1, don't we? There was a certain man of Ramathiam, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Alkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elu, son of Tofu, son of Zephu, an Inferite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the one... And the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, and Hannah had no children. This man, Alkanah, had two wives. One was named Hannah, and the other, Penina. And it is most likely that Hannah was the first wife, because she's named first in this passage. And she married Penina because Hannah was barren. Now, why would he do this? Because in the eastern, ancient east was a major problem if he didn't have an heir, as it is in today's places. The husband needed a son to continue his lineage into a next generation. A child who would inherit all of his riches. Now, Hannah was barren. She could not give him that. And him taking a, a second wife was solving that problem. Now we see in verse 2 that Panina had, the second wife had many children, but Hannah still had no children. Here is a woman named Hannah. And her name means favor or grace. Whose deepest longing and desire is to be a mother. That is a desire to bear a child for her husband. She wants to do right by him, but she's unable to do so because she is barren. The husband will go year after year to worship and sacrifice to her Lord at Shiloh. We see that in verse 3. Now this man used to go up every year from, from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the sons of Elu, Hophni, and Phineas were priests of the Lord. This perhaps was a way of him thanking the Lord for, for his blessings over him, thanking the Lord for his riches, but also thanking the Lord for the children that he has received through his second wife. But as he makes this sacrifices to the Lord, he could be praying to God, God, won't you open up the womb of my first wife, Hannah? And won't you bless her with children? And despite the fact that the husband, despite the fact that Hannah still had no children, the husband still thinks highly of her. He still loves her deeply and will give to her double portion compared to his first, to his second wife and her children. Look at the verses in verse on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Panina, his wife, and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, 
He gave a double portion because he loved her. Though her womb was closed. The Lord had closed her womb. This is one of the lessons that Hannah had to learn. That it was God who was in control. That it was God who closed her womb. Therefore, it is God who is able to act in this situation. In the midst of her sorrow and afflictions, she had to learn and to hold on to the truth. That God is in control. Hannah was mocked and abused by the second wife because she was barren. She was the laughing stock around the family table. Perhaps uh, Panina did this out of jealousy because Alcana would give to her the, the double portion as opposed to her and her children. And we see this cr- cruel treatment went on year after year after year after year. This was a difficult situation for her. She was mocked. She was provoked. She was made fun of. And this resulted in a weeping and she did not eat. This concerned Elkanah because she loved her dearly. Perhaps as he was listening to all these talks around the table, he turns to her and he says this in verse 8. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Elkanah misses the point here. There are no words of comfort that Hannah can hear that will equal the weight of holding her firstborn. There are no words that can comfort Hannah as she longs to bear children, as she longs to be a mother and hold that little one in her hands. Not even the kind words from her husband. Am I not more to you than ten sons? Alkana asks. But Hannah does not answer the question. Hannah had to learn that as she waits upon the Lord, she had to remember that God is still in control. God is still in control. He is the one who is able to vindicate her and give to her the blessing of a child. And this is a truth that we need to learn today. That despite our afflictions, despite the harshness, treatment that we may receive, regardless of our circumstances that we may find ourselves in, God is still in control. He has not left us. He has not left his throne. He still sits in the seat of power. And as we wait upon him, he will act. And we need to trust that he is in control. Think about your circumstances. I don't know what you've been going through the week. I don't know what faces your life today. But thus I know that every single child of God goes through some form of afflictions. But in your afflictions right now, today, Do you still believe that God is in control? That God still sits at the throne. And as you begin to trust God, as you begin to hold on that God is faithful, to other people it may seem crazy as they are watching your life, as you continue to hold on to his faith. They They may even ask you, why do you still continue to trust in God and wait on him? And yes, you will be mocked for your faith. You will be provoked to curse God. Believer here tonight, you need to wait upon the Lord and know that he is in control. And as you wait upon him, 
we do so with patience and trust. And this leads us to our second point. As you wait, be patient and trust the Lord. Hannah had to escape the crew mockery that she was surrounded by around the family dinner table. She could not find comfort from the words of her husband, and so she flees to the house of the Lord. And at first glance, not even the priest understood her. Hannah was troubled in her heart, and she knew that the only place that she could go to was in the house of the Lord. And what did she do there? Verses 10 and 11. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and not a razor shall touch his head. She comes before the Lord and pours out her heart. She lets all of her emotions out and she weeps before the Lord. Hannah is confident in the God who is able to comfort her in her afflictions. The God who is able to bring hope in her hopelessness. And so she prays. She offers a son to whom God will give to her, back to him, and says, Lord, if you give me a son, I will set him apart for you. And all the days of his life will be for you and for you only. His life will be to the service of God. What we see happening here, the vow that Hannah makes is a Nazarite vow. And we learn about this vow in Numbers chapter 6. Let's tend it together for a bit. Numbers chapter 6, picking it up from verse 1. Give me an amen if you're there. Amen. Must be nice having phones just to scroll. And we read the following in Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine not even the seeds or the skins, all the days of his vows of separation. No razor shall touch his head until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall let the locks of hair of his head grow long. And so as Hannah makes this vow before the Lord, she says, God, the son to whom you give to me, I will give back to you. And all the days of his life, from his birth, he will be set apart for your work. That's how much Hannah wants a child. But she knew that she had to wait upon the Lord. Only he could act. And so as Hannah prays, she does so in her heart. Only her lips moves. She can't seem to put into audible words what she's feeling inside. And so in her heart, she prays to God. And God hears her. God hears the most silent prayers. But as Eli, who sits on the seats of authority, looks at her, he says to himself, my gosh, this woman must be drunk. Unbelievable. Let's look together. Look at verse 14. Here's what he says. 
And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Probably saying, here is another one. They've just been to the party. She has drank as, and now has come to the house of the Lord and is acting all crazy. And so he thinks to himself, hey woman, how can you offend the sanctuary by coming here drunk? Have you no respect for the house of the Lord? But Hannah tends to him and explains that her visible emotions are of genuine sorrow. That her emotions are genuine and they come from a place of, of deep anguish. She exclaims in verse 15 to 17, but Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drank neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and, and vexation. Do not think of me as a drunk woman, but I've been pouring my heart out to the Lord, the one who understands my afflictions. In a state of anxiousness, of worry and frustration, Hannah turns to the Lord. The waiting was too long. It has become unbearable to the point that she was anxious and frustrated. The second wife was mocking her and provoking her to act out against her. But Hannah flees from that environment and runs to the throne of grace. She knows that she has to be patient. She knows that she has to trust in God. But even as she waits, things are not easy. She is prone to give in. She is prone to be impatient. As anxiety arises, emotions or frustrations take hold of her. She knows, I have to be patient. And so she brings it all to the Lord and she pours her heart out. She lays it all at the throne of grace. And this is the wonderful truth we have as believers. That God calls us, calls you and I to be patient and to trust in him in the midst of our afflictions. He knows that it won't be easy. He knows that we'll experience great turmoil and frustrations. We'll become anxious. And it can be easy to give in to those emotions and allow them to determine our actions. It can be easy to withdraw from God because we think, well, God, God is silent. God doesn't understand me. He's doing nothing. And so we think it's better to withdraw from him. But on the contrary, that's when we should be seeking God. That's when we should be appearing before him. That's when we should be desiring his presence, to allow his presence to fuel our emotions, knowing that he got us. God got you. Run to him, O oh believer. Run to a throne of grace where hope is found. Even as you draw near to him, there will be times when you don't have the words. As you appear before him, you don't know what to say. But God looks at your heart and he listens to it. God listens to the prayers of your heart. Don't become impatient and give in to emotions, but continue to trust in him. Allow your heart to speak to God for he listens to it. Sometimes we can be very, very impatient. I've been guilty of it, and I'm sure you've been guilty of it. 
A woman once stalled her car in traffic. She looked in vain under the hood to identify the cause. While, while, the, driver, while the driver behind her leaned r- relentlessly on his horn. Boop, 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 boop. Finally, she had enough. And she walked over to his car and politely said, I don't know what's the matter with my car. But if you want to go and have a look, I'll stay behind and press the horn for you. Hey, don't be that guy. As you wait upon the Lord, trust in him. God will act. And this leads us to our final point. As you wait... God will act. The priest blesses Hannah after this misconfusion to to mistaking her for being drunk. He sends her off her way and blesses her and says, I do pray, I do hope that God hears the petitions of your heart. She leaves and she's no longer sad. And when she gets home, she eats. Look at that. Hannah went to the house of the Lord, sad, grieved in her spirit. But after she has met with the Lord, and as she goes home, her face is no longer sad. And and this is the amazing thing. Hope has been restored. And this happens when we come to the presence of the Lord. He gives hope. And in verse 19 to 20, we read of these words. And they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. While she waits, while she waits for the Lord to act, for the Lord to vindicate her and to do right by her, Hannah worships him. Her faith is not blind faith. It is not the kind of faith that sits around and says, well, I'm just waiting for God to act. He'll do something. But a faith is the kind that says, I want to cling on to God. As he acts, I will work. I will worship him. I will continue to trust in him. This is the kind of faith that we need to have. Though her mourning Remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And this leads her to worship the God who is in control, the God who is faithful and who will do right by her, the one who does right by his servant. Alkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered Hannah. And in due time, I love that word, In due time. That is to say, God acted at his timing. When God saw that the time was now right, that the time has now come for you to have a son, God acts. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, whom she called Samuel, for she says, I've asked for him from the Lord. The meaning of Samuel naturally means name of God or offspring of God. Samuel bore the name of God because it is God who gave Samuel to Hannah. God remembered his servant. He looked upon her circumstances and in due time he acted. In due time, God will act believers. 
in all that is happening in your life. In all that you have prayed for and asked God for. In due time, God will act. And he will give to you according to his riches in heaven. According to what he has planned and purpose for your life. Wait patiently for the Lord. He is working behind the scenes. It may be underneath, hidden deep down in your character as he begins to mold you. In due time, God will reveal everything that he has grown in you. Those who wait upon the Lord will not be put to shame. They will never be disappointed. Question is, are you a servant of the Lord? Have you come to trust in him? Because these promises are only for those who have given their lives to God. Have you run to a throne of grace where mercy and forgiveness is found? God has promised that the one who comes to him, he will by no means turn away. And he says to you, look at the cross. Look at Calvary where my son hung for you. The one who hangs there, the one who bears your sins upon the cross. And he says, by his work, you can come to know him. Your sins are forgiven. But if you will confess, but if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, God will give to you a new life. A new life through his son. And as you live for him, as you begin to trust in him, remember he is the one that is in control. He is the one that holds your life in his hands. And God will act. God will do right by you according to his riches in heaven. Have you trusted in him? Have you put your whole faith in him? Have you hoped in him? Allow me to end with these words of a famous song which I've come to appreciate titled God Moves in a Mysterious Way. The song goes like this. It should be on the screen. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footstep in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in his dark and hidden minds with never failing skill. He fashions all his bright design and works his sovereign will. So God, we trust in you. Oh, faithful saints, take new courage. The clouds that you now dread are big with mercy and will break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind the frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. So God, we trust in you. Oh God, we trust in you. When tears are great and comforts few, we hope in mercies ever new, we trust in you. God's purpose will, re will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. So God, we trust in you. Oh God, may we trust in you. As you wait upon the Lord, your faith acts. 
Let's do so with patience. Let's do so in trust, knowing that he is in control. And in that right time, just at the right moment, God will act. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that wonderful promise that you never leave us nor forsake us, that you are forever with us. Even as we walk through the valley and the shadow of death, you are with us. You are the one that upholds us. And so, Lord, we pray that as we live in this world, we know that things are not always what they seem that we'll be faced with great afflictions, great tribulation. But may we trust in you. May we hope in you. And may our faith be seen as we wait upon you. And so, Lord, work in our hearts. Produce patience in our hearts. Produce that steadfast love and steadfast faithfulness within us. Lord, we pray that even in the times when we are faced with those afflictions, when, Lord, we do not have the words of expression to express how we feel, may we not run away from you, but may we draw nearer to you, knowing that you hear the prayers of our hearts. Even though we may not say the words, you still hear us. Thank you for that. Thank you that you do not look lightly on our emotions. But before you, we can weep. Before you, we can laugh and cry. We thank you for that. And so, Lord, we pray that our faith may be seen as we wait upon the God who is in control. Take hold of us. Fill us with your spirit. Lead and guide us direct our every move and step that in everything that we do may we look to you and even as we live in this world and look forward to your coming may we not lose heart may we not grow weary but may we long for your coming knowing that yes one day you will return and you will come for your bride may we be ready for your return. Cause us to be faithful in our waiting. We pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.